Okay. So, you know, I was Deputy Secretary General of NATO, so number two at NATO uh, from uh, 2016 through 2019, so three years. Uh, during that period, uh, NATO was still in Afghanistan uh, and um, we didn't have the crisis we have today with Russia, although it was a very difficult period with Russia, nevertheless. Uh, but uh, there were always a lot of questions about Turkey's membership in NATO because they were not being very cooperative after the coup attempt in Turkey in the summer of 2016, uh, Erdogan, uh, the president, uh, started to work with the Russians to buy the so-called S-400 air defense system. And this caused an enormous amount of stress uh, in Turkey's relationship with NATO because NATO always emphasizes that countries have the right to, to choose you know, what weapon systems to buy themselves, but they should be interoperable with NATO systems and they should not cause harm to NATO systems. And there was a lot of concern that the S-400 um, would be used, uh, you know, even though it's in the hands of the Turks, it could be used by the Russians to discover some of the secret operating uh, procedures of the so-called F-35 a fighter jet. So this was a huge time of stress with Turkey. Uh, a lot of people uh, very concerned that Turkey just wasn't being cooperative. Now the Secretary General of NATO, I was not at NATO uh, when the coup happened. It was the summer before I arrived. But he, uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, always said uh, that he understood the stress that uh, that the Turkish government was under, that Erdogan himself was under. He went to visit right after the coup took place and he saw for himself the damage that had been caused to the presidential palace. So he always tried to keep a very, very straight line about Turkey. Turkey is a good ally in operational terms. They were always uh, right at the top of the list of those countries willing to take part in military operations. Uh, they were protecting, uh, at the time, the Hamid Karzai airport in Kabul, which was a very dangerous and difficult task. You know, Krish, to this day, Turkey is keeping that airport open, working together with the UAE uh, and with, uh, well, now with the Taliban regime. But uh, they always went out of their way to take on difficult operational missions of that kind. And for that reason, and I always said the same thing when I was Deputy Secretary General, that uh, Turkey is a good ally in operational terms. Uh, we often have differences with different allies, uh, but in fact, in my view, Turkey was the, not the most difficult of the allies to work with. Uh, to be honest with you, France <laughs> yeah, was more difficult know. as an ally to work with uh, than Turkey. And so um, in general, although there were these stresses and strains, we always emphasized uh, the value of Turkey as an operational uh, partner and a good ally from, from that perspective. Uh, the other factor, of course, is their long running, um, well, I would say it's more than just uh, differences with Greece, it's en enmity with Greece, uh, which often borders on uh, a, hot, uh, a hot crisis. Uh, again, after I left NATO in the summer of uh, 2020, the Eastern Mediterranean heated up it's always the issue over Cyprus. In this case, it also had to do with the discovery of, of uh, gas and oil reserves in the Eastern Med and uh, who was going to you know, have ownership of those gas and oil uh, uh, reserves. So there are always stresses and strains between Greece and Turkey as well, which contributes to, I think, uh, the negative perception that many, many have of, uh, of Turkey, uh, not only in uh, the NATO alliance, but in the European Union more broadly. And as you know, Turkey's had a, a bid out to become a member of the EU for a long, long time. But uh, frankly, it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. So there we are. That's my uh, few remarks, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have as well. Of course. And I have a few questions just off of your uh, initial remark. The first one being between Greece and Turkey. And since both of these are NATO members, I was just wondering, how, how NATO helps with diplomacy between these two countries, particularly when there's a lot of tension. I know France might be taking sides towards Greece. Um, how does NATO as a cohesive unit help solve these issues? 
Well, you have to distinguish between the NATO members, the now 30 NATO member states that sit around the North Atlantic Council table, the so-called MAC table, the North Atlantic Council, and uh, the leadership of NATO itself, the international staff under the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General. And then there's a whole international staff of uh, just over a thousand people. So um, our role as the international staff is always to try to facilitate uh, diplomacy between uh, member states that are, um, that are fighting, not fighting maybe on the battlefield, but are arguing about things and having differences. So um, I once um, there was a difference while I was DSG between uh, between Turkey and Germany because Germany was you know perceived as going after uh, Muslim citizens in in Germany and uh, also Erdogan perceived that Germany was sheltering some of the officers who had participated in the coup so it was a very difficult period uh, in the German uh, Turkish relationship and. Uh, and so Turkey would not allow German parliamentarians to go visit an airbase in Turkey where German soldiers were stationed with the mm -hmm. so-called AWACS plane, the airborne warning and control uh, aircraft that was stationed in Turkey. And this made the German government crazy. You know, they were really upset about this. But I basically facilitated a trip where I went with the parliamentarians as a kind of I'm not going to say as a babysitter, but I went with them as the kind of representative of the NATO leadership. So it was kind of a NATO expedition, if you see what I mean, rather than a German expedition. And that helped in that case. So that's one example. But the other example is this uh, crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean in 2020, when uh, it was the uh, assistant uh, secretary general for operations. So that's three levels down in the organization. He was a guy named John Manza. M-A-N-Z-A at the time, but he facilitated uh, the establishment of a working group at NATO uh, between uh, Turkey and Greece to talk about this crisis in the Eastern Med and to begin to get the two of them on a more, I would say, positive trajectory, a more positive road uh, toward coming to some resolution of the crisis. Uh, because they did have their, that was relevant because they did have their naval ships and their Coast Guard ships out there, you know, uh, really uh, beginning to get into a situation where there could have been some shots fired. And so from a NATO perspective, the last thing we want is the allies shooting at each other. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's why it was relevant to have the Assistant Secretary General of Operations try to facilitate a working group in which they brought, brought the temperature down, brought the level of crisis down, and, and were beginning then to work together bilaterally to resolve the issues. So those are some of the examples of how NATO works on these, these questions, but the NATO uh, leadership, uh, it's really always a facilitation role. We cannot like order NATO members to do anything. Right. It has to be the NATO members who are ready, uh, who are ready for that type of um, arbitration. Of course, a um, couple more questions. The one focused on nuclear weapons and the United States relationship with Turkey. I was just wondering, um, given that the U.S. has uh, encircled air, air base in Turkey and it has U.S. troops there, how do they handle the U.S. nuclear weapons? Why is there a strategic initiative to put um, U.S. nuclear weapons in Turkey? Is it to deter Russia or I guess what is the general goal? Yes, uh, there are uh, actually very few so-called uh, NATO nuclear weapons. These are weapons that are devoted to the NATO nuclear mission. Uh, you'll, you can find uh, the numbers in the uh, Federation of American Scientists have a very good database of warheads around the world mm -hmm. on an unclassified basis. So it's uh, you know around 100 warheads and they are spread out uh, in a number of uh, NATO countries. Uh, as uh, a former official of NATO, I can neither confirm nor deny that they are in Turkey. Uh, but what I will say is that the United States, uh, with those NATO uh, nuclear weapons, maintains control of the weapons at all times. They are not in the hands of um, the different basing countries. Uh, they exercise no control over them. So uh, U.S. Uh, teams do reside at the various uh, bases around NATO where the nuclear weapons are uh, deployed, and they do keep uh, keep day-to-day uh, -day control over the weapons. Um, there are, as I said, though, in each of the NATO countries, there are, uh, there are 
troops from other NATO countries deployed. In the Baltic states and Poland today, we have these battle groups, which are 1,200 people or so, 12 to 1,500 people. But those battle groups are made up of units from all over NATO. I mentioned that there were Germans deployed in, in Turkey at the AWACS base. Uh, so in some ways, it's natural that there would be Americans also deployed in Turkey. Uh, and there used to be a lot more Americans uh, deployed in Turkey and in uh, NATO European countries overall. I was just looking at these numbers because Putin is complaining that there are you know, so many Americans deployed in, in Europe now. But as a matter of fact, uh, in 1997, he says he wants the numbers to go back to the 1997 numbers. In 1997, there were 100,000 Americans deployed in, in Europe. And today there are 70,000 Americans deployed in Europe. So yeah. I've been saying yeah. to the Russians, well, you want us to go back up to 100,000? Is that what, really what you want? But, uh, but honestly, the numbers have come down very significantly. Yeah. Um, one more question I think we, we can ask is basically revolving around the Ukrainian situation. There's a lot of tension in Ukraine, particularly with Russia. And Turkey kind of acts as a geopolitical benefit for NATO. It extends NATO's, uh, I guess, eyes and ears. Um, to Asia, to Russia, to Europe, and to the Middle East. So I was wondering, Turkey as a geopolitical benefit and with the second largest military within NATO, how can that, how can that nation provide a benefit to handle the situation in Ukraine um, against Russia? Well, a very important aspect here, Krish, uh, is uh, their um, international responsibility to implement the Montreux Convention, and they absolutely control uh, the access of war uh, ships to the Black Sea. Uh, and so <clears throat> I think, frankly, here is an area uh, that uh, Turkey plays a rather responsible role in ensuring that there cannot be a huge buildup of uh, ships of war in the, in the Black Sea. Uh, there are some uh, NATO naval exercises going on now in the Mediterranean. There have been Russian um, naval exercises going on in the Mediterranean, but you know the notion that somehow all of these warships could rush into the Black Sea uh, to you know either exercise or get into some kind of um, battles in the Black Sea, really I, I don't see happening because again of, of Turkey's control of, uh, of the straits through which they would have to pass <clears throat> the Bosphorus, excuse me. So um, that's one aspect. The other aspect <clears throat> is that Turkey does uh, have a rather, um, I would say, um, more, well, it's a more multifaceted relationship with Moscow, I think, than other, some other countries of NATO have. They are neighbors across the Black Sea. Uh, Russia and Turkey have had differences over the seizure of Crimea in 2014 because Turkey has been very concerned about uh, the, uh, the status of the Tatars, uh, the Muslim Tatars uh, living in uh, Crimea, Crimean Tatars, and the Russians have been treating them very, very badly. And so Turkey has had some real you know, sharp words with Moscow over the fate of the Crimean Tatars. At the same time, as I said, they are purchasing weapons from Moscow. So that is uh, a rather, I would say, more positive aspect in their relationship. And then furthermore, they have uh, coexisted uh, during the Syrian civil war in Syria and uh, you know, have been fighting uh, in different ways. Of course, the Turks focused their ire on the, on the Kurds and uh, the PKK, the uh, various uh, Turkish uh, parties uh, in the Syria, involved in the Syrian civil war. The, the Russians, of course, are propping up the Assad regime. So they have rather different goals in some ways, but they have been, uh, I'm not going to say cooperating, but they have been operating in close proximity and have been deconflicting to ensure that they don't get in each other's way in Syria. So I would say they have a rather uh, deep and multifaceted relationship. Uh, and so I do believe that it is possible, and Erdogan has been talking to Putin, I do believe it is possible that Turkey could play some role in facilitating resolution of the Ukrainian crisis. But so far, it's not been evident. It's been very much behind the scenes if it's taking place. Of course. Well, thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure to interview you. Um, you are welcome and good luck. I have a little secret to tell you. You know, the uh, woman out here on the West Coast who's organizing the uh, 
the uh, Oakland team called me up and she wanted me to talk to her group too. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have time. <laughs> so you can see the benefit of being from Arlington High School. <laughs> yes, I do. I do. Well, thank you so much. Good luck with the debate and let me know how it comes out. Of course I will. And I will stop the recording now as well.